Welcome back to the Aliosha Society, friends, where we're pursuing truth and beauty and goodness through great literature. What do you think? As the jury returned a verdict. What do you mean on what? The shirt. It, I specifically picked the, oh, well, let me explain why. You see, the underground man is actually kind of a joke. He's dull, unexciting, blah, below average. Yeah, a little bit like that, you know, kind of, yeah, yeah, he's a good, good thing for the poop emoji. So I chose the most blah, boring, gray. This, this fits the underground man. I know you don't understand that yet because we haven't gotten into the story. But yeah, let's see how it plays out. Gray for the underground man. Man, reflecting on all the great adventures we've had together, you know, all the way back from the days of blue doing the Pilgrim's Progress and red and Gulliver's Travels and we did pink for poetry and white for Jane Austen. Remember all that? Green for Frankenstein. All right. I think this fits. I think it fits. Okay, guys, this is video number two. We're going to finish up our history background in this one. Then in the third video, we'll kind of get more into bio and then, you know, the other, the other uh, tools in the toolbox, the literary tools in the toolbox. And then it is only in video four when we'll finally get to the text. So technically, you don't have any reading that you should have done for this video. What you should be doing is paying attention to the videos, taking some notes, shooting me an email if there's something you don't understand, and, and, and just, just soaking it in. Take notes, whatever. So do you remember where we ended up? Okay, remember, we started in 862. Vladimir becomes a Christian in 987. Is it coming back to you? Russia is what kind of nation for hundreds of years? Right, a Christian nation. Even when the Mongols conquer Russia, they still allow them to practice their faith. We talked about Ivan, and we talked about Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. I think that's where we left off. I think that's where we left off. Oh, yes, reviewing the toolbox. Historical context, on it. Biographical context, coming. We will look at the life of Dostoevsky from beginning to end. Genre questions, you betcha. Literary devices, oh yeah. And then we'll definitely get to the story arc, the five elements of a plot. So where'd we leave off? All right, we are, oh yes, we're actually almost up to, oh, where can I stick myself? Oh, let's go way down here. We're almost up to the time of the birth of Dostoevsky. So 1801, so the beginning of the 19th century. Now, do you remember in previous videos, previous books we've looked at, the difference between the Enlightenment, 18th century, and Romanticism, 19th century? Because I'm, I'm not going to review that in the same amount of detail that I have in previous videos. So 18th century enlightenment, reason, focus on science, these advances, not necessarily, definitely a different way of looking at biblical authority, deism, kind of the idea that eh, there might be a God out there somewhere that made everything, but then he just kind of left it all alone. Enlightenment, Voltaire, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, when we, we, we talked a lot about Rousseau. But then the Enlightenment, I mean, sorry, the uh, Romanticism, you remember we talked about how Mary Shelley was born like right, right on the bend, you know, right on the door hinge when Enlightenment ideals were still popular, but this new way of thinking was beginning to permeate culture called Romanticism. So instead of the authority being up here, now there's more focus on passion and nature and feelings as a guide. And, you know, remember the two tenets of romanticism? 
man is basically good and his progress is inevitable. So that's where we are now. We're, we're kind of launching into that, that time period. So we have Alexander the first who uh, serves as the Russian czar for the first quarter of the 19th century. What was he doing? Well, he was raised with a lot of enlightenment influence. And, you know, and, and, and at first, he actually tried to keep in step. Oh, yeah, we got to keep up with Europe. But he actually shifted and turned out to be a pretty harsh ruler and tried to sort of pull back the reins and go back to a more conservative, traditional way of thinking. It is right smack dab in, in, in that environment, my friends, that Fyodor Dostoevsky was born in 1821, right near the end of the rule of Alexander I. So after, um, uh, so he was only four years old when Alexander dies and his brother, becomes the next czar of Russia, Nicholas I. Probably, honestly, the most important czar, I would say, that we're going to, you know, concerning Dostoevsky at least, because he kind of did the same thing, tried to sort of pull back, go more conservative. Yeah, we're not going to, we're not going to, you know. Well, he ended up being the czar who was in charge when Dostoevsky, I'll give you the details on this later, was arrested in 1849 for being a part of an anti czarist uh, you know progressive political group called the Petrushevsky circle and he ends up being sent away in exile for nearly 10 years four of those years he served in hard labor with leg chains on his ankles 24/7 he ended up doing six years of mandatory military service, but, you know, he was standing there with a blindfold on, waiting for a bullet to go through his head, and Tsar Nicholas I commuted his sentence, then he was sent away. More details on that later. Dostoevsky lived a rough life. Let me, let me just say that. He did. All right, now, during this time, the tension between the Slavophiles and the Westernizers intensifies. I would say it's a little bit like the tension between Democrats and Republicans in the United States today. Not exactly. There are definitely some differences. But you know how that, that debate can be very contentious, very mean. You know, people, I mean, they, sometimes there's even violence involved. Well, that, that's sort of what is going on. These are two different visions for the future of Russia. You know, is Russia going to be more traditional, conservative, orthodox Christian, or is it going to be more like Europe and be more progressive, more liberal, and embrace those enlightenment ideas? That tension is, is really just starting to kind of come to a boiling point, you know, and eventually you know, the volcano erupts. The Slavophiles said, Peter the Great, it's his fault. He's the one that started this movement towards making Russia more European. You know, boo for Peter the Great. So, um, all right, there you go. He, uh, Alexander II is uh, czar of Russia. He ends up getting assassinated in 1881. And we're not really going to go beyond that because that is the same year in which Dostoevsky died. So life and times of Fyodor Dostoevsky. How does he fit into all this? Well, I already said that he was born in 1821. Moscow, yeah. Remember I said most of the population of Russia is over there in the California, Nevada, Oregon equivalent, you know, over there in the western part. And then you go, there's, a, there's a, a mountain chain that comes straight down. I would say if you're in the far western part of Russia and you start driving, I don't know, it's about 15 or 20% of the way. I'm just using ballpark. I don't have a map up here to show you. And, and then beyond those mountains, 
the population the population is much 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 more sparse it's very dense over in the western part but anyway that's where Dostoevsky's born now take a look at what happens to him 16 years old his mother dies just kind of pointing out some of the sadness that he experienced two years later his dad dies and there's all kinds of mystery surrounding the death of Dostoevsky's father. Dostoevsky's father was a surgeon, a military surgeon. So they were, you know, middle, middle to middle upper class. They, they were not living in poverty. He had an estate with some serfs on his estate. And there are all these, I don't know if they're conspiracy theories or if they're true, but he was possibly murdered by his own serfs on his estate. Uh, okay, his dad always wanted him to be an engineer. Of course he did, you know, be, a, be a, 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 an officer in the military, be an engineer. Dostoevsky just wanted to be a writer. That's all he wanted to do. And after his father died, even though that was tremendously difficult and sad for Dostoevsky, it kind of freed him up to pursue his real dream, which was to be a writer. He, he and his older brother, Mikhail, both really wanted to, they were very, very, they were kind of like lit nerds together, you know, and best friends. So his first novel was published in 1846, Poor Folk, an epistolary novel, if you remember what an epistolary novel is from our studies of Frankenstein, that is an epistolary novel. So that brings us up to the end of 18, the 1840s. So Dostoevsky was raised in a Christian home, totally Christian, heard the Bible read by his parents, attended church. I mean, all of the, the things that would go along with being a Christian. But like many teenagers, he started to kind of question his faith, and he got involved with a more of a kind of left-leaning, progressive political group, not so Christian happens with teenagers sometimes. And he ended up, they were called the Petrushevsky Circle. And they would have these meetings and they were kind of anti-government, you know, anti-establishment. Dostoevsky wasn't really the ringleader of the group. He was curious. He was asking questions. But one day, bam, Nicholas I sends in, you know, the troops. They break up the meeting. They arrest all of the members of the Petrushevsky Circle and they go on trial, and Dostoevsky is sentenced to death. So he would have been executed in 1849, and we would not be talking about him. Because his one novel, Poor Folk, which is fantastic, I love it. I don't really think it would have kept him on the literary map, definitely not as long as he has been. So at the, uh, at the very end of the day, he's got the blindfold on, he's standing there waiting for the firing squad, to put a bullet through his head. And at the last second, a horseman rode up, messenger from Nicholas I. Hold on, stop your guns. Their sentences have been commuted. Or they would have said that in Russian. And so instead of getting executed, Dostoevsky ends up doing hard time. And while he was actually on his way, literally marching to Siberia, the frozen tundra on the other side of those mountains, a young lady who was a widow of one of the men who was, who was killed because of his involvement in an anti-government movement, the Decembrists they were called, this is back in the 1820s, handed him a copy of the Gospels. That's the only book he was allowed to have while he was in Siberia. And so he read it, he marked it up, and he basically came back to his faith in Siberia, in all of the suffering. Near the end of that time, he married a lady named Maria. And then uh, exactly 10 years after he was sent away, he returns back to the West, this time to St. Petersburg. He's going to get back together with Mikhail. They're going to start working together. But Maria dies after seven years of marriage. 1864 was a heavy year for Dostoevsky because 
he and his brother were kind of getting their business started, this, this publication they were working on. His wife dies, and it's in big, fat, red letters, friends, because that's when he published Notes from Underground, the novella that we're going to be reading. So I hope you're taking all this in. Just a little uh, sort of quick snapshot of Dostoevsky's family, Dr. Mikhail. His mother's name was Maria. Lots of kids. Well, Bruce, where's Mikhail and Theodore? Well, they, they were the first two. All right. Then his parents had these six other children. So Dostoevsky and Mikhail were the oldest. How about Dostoevsky's family? Well, uh, let's say, look, he, he married Maria in 1857, not a happy marriage. I, yeah, I'm not going to take sides. I don't know whose fault it was. She seems like she might have been kind of grumpy. But you know what? Dostoevsky probably wasn't, you know, always the life of the party either. But she died after seven years of marriage. She brought a child into the marriage. I got a, a boy named Pasha. She had from a previous marriage. So Dostoevsky now has a stepson, not a biological son, a stepson to take care of after Maria dies. And let me just say, he was a piece of work. Pasha was a piece of work. Yeah, he even sold Dostoevsky's library one time because he said, well, you didn't leave me enough money. So I sold your library, which apparently had a lot of, you know, old volumes and valuable books in it. So uh, let's see. Then he remarries in 1867, a young girl who, uh, whom he hired to be his stenographer, which is basically just someone who is very, very skilled at taking dictation. So he, Dostoevsky did not literally write his novels. You know, Crime and Punishment, Brothers Karamazov, Demons, uh, A Raw You. He didn't write them. He spoke them and his his scribe, so to speak, his stenographer, literally took notes and wrote, wrote them out. So he hired this young girl to be a stenographer, but then they fell in love. Her name was Anna. They ended up uh, getting married and had several children together. Little Theodore, uh, two of them actually died at very early ages. So once, once again, Dostoevsky had a lot of joy in his life, and he had a lot of valleys. He had a fair amount of sadness in his life. So what I want to do now is I want to show you just a big picture timeline. I, I like to see the forest, guys. Born in 1821, Nicholas comes to the throne in 1825. He is not executed in 1849. That red, orangish line there represents his time in, in prison and exile. Comes back 10 years later, marries Maria. She dies seven years into the marriage. He, uh, 1867, he married his second wife. Right before that, he had dictated crime and punishment to her. Where can I stick myself? Here we go. He had actually dictated the novel. I, I think one of his very best novels, one of his most well-known novels, Crime and Punishment, in 1866. He married her uh, a year later. And he ended up dying in 1880. Uh, oops, I thought I had his death up here, but he died in 1881. But where does our book fit? This big context, bam, right there. I put it in big fat red letters and numbers for you. All right, just a couple of years before he married his second wife, but um, at really at the, I mean, Maria was, they had been married for five years at this point. So he still was with Maria. She would end up dying, I guess, uh, two years after that, right? Six, yeah. Okay. So I, I found this picture of his two wives. I thought you guys might find it very interesting. I th honestly, I think the picture says it all. I mean, you know what? Maybe Maria was having a bad day, but I'm sorry, she looks a little grumpy in the picture. And then Anna over here, you know, looks like this young, pleasant, delightful lady. I, I don't know, you know. I, I do know that, that, that even though Anna was way younger than Dostoevsky, they had a very happy marriage. 
And well, after he died, she wrote a, a book called Reminiscences, just kind of yeah, about their life together. Very, 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 very good book. All right, moving on. 1865, gambling spree, crime and punishment. Yeah, he had a problem with, with gambling. The only addiction I know of that Dostoevsky had was gambling. He didn't have a problem with drinking, mainly because he had epilepsy. And uh, alcohol and epilepsy apparently don't mix very well. Mary's uh, Anna in 1867. They actually took a four-year trip to Europe just to get away from Visa and MasterCard. Yeah, their creditors were just beaten down the tour and he was still struggling with a gambling addiction. So they basically just packed up and, and went to Europe to hide. Uh, he also went to Europe to find some medical attention for his epilepsy, but Dostoevsky gave a very famous speech in 1880 at the unveiling of the uh, monument dedicated to Russia's national poet, a guy named Pushkin. I wish we had time to talk about Pushkin, but there you go, 1881, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000, which guys, in 1881, that's like a gazillion people, you know, to show up for a funeral to pay their respects to their beloved Slavophile, their beloved author, Fyodor Dostoevsky. But, you know, it, just in better understanding the man, look at what he went through. You know, I, I, call, uh, I call him the man of suffering. He's a little bit like a Job. You know, he had epilepsy and he got that. He contracted epilepsy while he was in the Siberian prison. He experienced a fake execution, which would mess anybody up psychologically. He was imprisoned for four years, and it was rugged. Then he had six years of mandatory military service. His wife dies in April of 1864. Yeah, go back in the video. I think I may have gotten my math a little mixed up on the timeline with the death of Maria. 1864 is the right year. For some reason, when I was talking earlier, I had in my mind that they were married in 1859, but they were married in 1857. So make sure you get that corrected. But look at this, guys. Just a couple of months after his wife dies, his brother died. His brother was his best friend. No doubt about it. So along with the gambling addiction and the death of two children who didn't even barely make it out of uh, infancy and one of them as a toddler. And just generally speaking, he always, always, always had money problems. So anytime you read Dostoevsky, you should come back to this slide. All right, keep it, take a screenshot of it because it informs how you're going to understand his novels, which frequently have the message, God works through suffering. God builds things. God grows things. God teaches us things through suffering. And he knew because he experienced it. Now, I'm not going to go over this slide. I'm only sticking it up here to show you that another one of the really cool tools in the literary toolbox would be um, studying what an author's favorite books happen to be. That's going to give you insight into understanding that author's work. I put one of them in red because I thought you guys would find it interesting. Do you remember who Ann Radcliffe was? Come on. You remember Ann Radcliffe? Northanger Rabbi. Ann Radcliffe wrote the Gothic novel, The Mysteries of Udolpho, which is the book that Isabella and Catherine Moreland were reading. Silly, giddy teenage girls. Bam. Dostoevsky grew up with his parents reading him Ann Radcliffe novels <laughs> at bedtime. <laughs> Yeah, I think at one point he said, yeah, I'm pretty sure we were a little bit scarred by that. He survived. All right, covering a lot of material here, friends. One more introductory video, and I promise we'll get into the text after that. I'll be back. I'll have on my underground gray. 
See you there.